everything that Dr. Ducio said is true. I'm Rebecca. Oh, yeah. sorry. I don't know that's not gesture as much. Um, and yeah, I went to Palenque, Colombia last summer to conduct research on code switching. And um, your first question might be, okay, why do I want to listen to another presentation about code switching? But I swear I'm unique, just like everybody else, because um, lengua and Spanish are really interesting. There's an interesting dynamic that occurs in this village because lengua and Spanish are two languages that are very cognate, so they share almost identical vocabularies. However, they do not share phonotactic uh, properties and they do not share grammar. So when individuals are speaking this these two languages, they'll often mix them and then it's kind of interesting to find out where the borders between these two languages exist, even though they share a lot of the same words. So yeah, my experiment was investigating which grammar structures in lengua um, sort of trigger bilinguals in these two languages to identify that they're hearing lengua versus Spanish. And that's what the title means. And <laughs> that's the picture of us, that, that was the group of us. I'm in the middle, I don't know if you recognize me. But I've gotten a little ahead of myself, I'm gonna explain a little bit about Palenque first, for those of you who don't know. San Basilio de Palenque is a very small village about 70 kilometers south of Cartagena. It is comprised of around 4,000 inhabitants. And um, they all speak Spanish and what's called lengua palenquera. And lengua palenquera is thought to originate from Kikongo, which is a Bantu language that's from the central, from central Africa. And, but it has a very sort of murky linguistic trajectory. Um, what is known is that throughout the 20th century, it did go under a, a long period of stigmatization, social stigmatization. So people were kind of phasing it out. They stopped speaking it as much in the home. They were stopped, uh, stopped teaching it as much to their children. And then um, in the 1970s, there was this boxing champion, Kid Pambele. You can tell I'm just as fierce as he is in this picture. But, um, <laughs> He really brought the spotlight to Palenque, and so linguists and anthropologists and all sorts of scientists started visiting Palenque, and eventually Lengua Palenquera was declared a gem of humanity by UNESCO. And ever since then, there's been this um, sort of push to revitalize the language. Um, and yeah, so they're teaching Lengua to children now, and um, it's kind of resulted in this really interesting dynamic, though, because there's a set of an older, of like an older generation of people who've really been speaking lengua since childhood, and they spoke it with their parents and their grandparents. And then a younger set of people who maybe spoke it less in the home, but I've learned it in school, which is very, it's a new variable. So um, I'll get back to it, so keep that in mind. Um, so yeah, when I was designing my stimuli for my experiments, I was keeping in mind um, some really defining characteristics of lengua that differentiated specifically from Spanish. So, I mean, we can run through this all pretty quickly, but ma plural, that's the indicator for that a noun is plural. So, for example, ma piunguli, that's the pigs. Um, that doesn't exist in Spanish. None of this exists in Spanish, but okay. Pronouns, the pronouns are very different. I, bo, ele, uh, I, you, he, she, it, suto, utere, ane. Um, all very distinct pronouns. The preverbal tense aspect and mode are also indicated differently from Spanish. If ta, a, and tan for the progressive, perfect, and future. And then, kind of most um, cacophonously that I can hear, at least when people are speaking lengua, is no gender agreement, which um, is really important. In the example that I used, I used a noun that's mujer in lengua, but mujer to mean woman in lengua can also kind of just be mistaken for mujer, which is the Spanish word for lengua. It is, however, the context here that's required to identify lengua. So if someone's to say mujer bonito with a, an adjective that's masculine, someone would immediately know, okay, I'm not speaking Spanish. So that's just a really key aspect that um, I was keeping in mind when I was designing this, this experiment and the stimuli. Um, so yeah, a little bit of a tidbit about the actual um, experience of conducting research in lengua. It was, I've worked in labs before, and this was the opposite of a lab experience. <laughs> uh, in a lab, you have white walls and right angles. Here you can see I'm outside, I'm inside, I'm all over the place. Um, and I really got to give credit to my participants, because I think that they were the ones keeping me on task. These people can focus on a task at hand. It's incredible. I'm eating with chickens and pigs and babies <laughs> running around. So these people really 
they really, um, you know, they kept their wits about them and they really did the task well. So, uh, yeah, that's, you know, it's an experience. It's fun. Um, the experiment itself was comprised of 65 code switch stimuli that I had written myself. Um, I presented them to the I presented them to the participants with headphones, and I basically told the participants that they would be listening to code switch sentences, and I wanted them to repeat the phrase, and I wanted them to just explain to me where they perceived the code switch to have occurred. There were no tricks; it was really straightforward. Um, and my participants, I had a really big age range from 13 to 65 years, and I had divided my participant groups into young people, which was individuals under 25 years old, and adults, which was 26 and above. Um, my, the hypothesis being that adults who had spoken lingua since childhood would be more accurate, more precise in identifying these code switches than younger people. So when I was writing the stimuli, I was also dividing it up according to Maskin's typology. I don't know if you guys are familiar with it, but we'll run through it. Everybody's nodding, but still have to run through it. Sorry, guys. Um, <laughs> so there's insertion, which is pretty self-explanatory. You just take one word from one language and put it into a sentence with another language. The example I have up here is, Tia la mi es muy seco, no hay apu. Tia la mi is a um, good example of the employment of uh, post nominal possessive. And then apu is just a lingual word for water. So uh, my land is very dry, there is no water. There's also alternation, which is just kind of long stretches of text um, in one language that's in another phrase that's in another language. So, uto mona akaiawe porque este patio de creo hace na. Oh, it's muy peligroso, sorry. I'm like a trilingual now. Um, so, another child fell yesterday because this playground is very dangerous. Um, as you can see, sort of a longer stretch of text and an insertion. The really interesting part was um, Maskin's congruent lexicalization, which is essentially like a, the structure is in one language, but it's lexicalized, lexicalized by the other. So the example that I used was, Numano mi atarrecho con nuestra madre, porque ella habla que no puede asistir la fiesta. And um, these sentences like these were the ones that kind of did the make or break. People were really kind of not identifying it or identifying it, they would mistake atarrecho to be in Spanish sometimes, which was very interesting to analyze. Um, I was also dividing my stimuli up to my own basic criteria, which had a little bit more to do with the location of the code switch than the actual content. And it was uh, clause boundary switches, noun insertion, verb insertion, noun and verb insertion. So all that will become important in a couple of slides. After Palenque, after collecting data in Palenque, I spent six weeks in Medellin, and I was consulting with um, Dr. Maria Dick at La Universidad de Antioquia. And my big question for her, oh, she's in the middle. That's okay. um, my big question for her was how I should be evaluating these responses, because it, they were, it was a free response task, and it's kind of hard to differentiate you know, if an answer is right or wrong. There was no yes or no. And she came up with the idea of kind of grading each participant. Um, they either got, so if they just identified that there was a code switch without elaborating about it, they just had like a good check. Um, if they identified it and identified it correctly, A plus, nice job. Uh, partial, they just picked out one word and didn't really explain the rest. Um, if they mistook it, they picked out a Spanish word and said it was lengua. Or if they missed it completely and they just said no code switch, even though I had told them that there would be one. So, yeah, the million dollar question is, Rebecca, does age make a difference in lingua fluency? And the short answer is no, <laughs> but it's fine. Um, I have other things to say. So, on that other graph, so here you have younger people and adults, and how they did individually based on the correct percentage score of how well they identified the code switches. And as you can see, there's no breaking point. They kind of show the same trends. Some people, you know, from my observations, some people did really poorly, probably because they were really tired, they were really distracted that day. And then some people did really well. Um, my next step, since age didn't seem to make a difference, my next step was evaluating the top five scores versus uh, the top lowest scores in sociolinguistic factors. You know, comparing education, comparing uh, their experience with lingua in the home. And that didn't really provide any details either. They were kind of all over the place. So, um, finally, I started reading between the lines, though, 
and it turns out that the top five scorers all have one thing in common. So they were either cultural entrepreneurs, they were, um, or lengua teachers, or they had had extensive experience working with linguistic researchers in the past couple of years, or some combination of those three. Um, and that's a big deal. You know, this was like the top five to seven scores for both of these graphs. So all of those activities kind of promote metalinguistic awareness. That was the big conclusion from these graphs. The next step was also just evaluating from the standpoint of the stimuli. So as you can see here, um, here. so this graph was according to my initial stimuli categorizations. You have clause boundary, verb insertion, noun insertion, verb and noun insertion. The blue being palenquero to, uh, to Spanish, and the orange being Spanish to palenquero, but the phrase started in one language and ended in another. Um, and then the other graph was Mouskin's categorizations, the colors are still the same. As you can see, there's really nothing, there's no significant difference between certain types of code switches and other types of code switches, but clause boundary switches and alternation switches seem to be the most consistently correctly identified, especially alternation switches with longer stretches of text in one language. So that kind of indicates that the, this had something to do with um, probably working memory too. So in phrases with alternation and like the phrase was longer in lengua, for example, perhaps they were better at remembering it after they had repeated it versus just like a small tidbit of it here and there. And then I made a line graph. I went back to evaluating the participants based on the individual basis and lo and behold, I found a trend. Um, yeah, so this orange line is cla clause boundary switches, and it's relatively flat compared to the other types of code switches, which essentially indicates that when you mix uh, young people and adult people and look at the overall trend, it was, it was a significant trend um, in comparison to dividing it up. But as you can see with the YA, young adult um, mm -hmm. formation, it's just they're everywhere. It's a lot of randomness. So yeah, what can we conclude? Age is not a factor, education is not necessarily a factor, metalinguistic awareness is a factor. Um, in the end, I kind of started analyzing this experiment in and of itself, and, and it doesn't really seem to be a good assessment of fluency in lengua, more so of these people's ability to analyze lengua. And um, that ability doesn't necessarily come with being able to speak it like a native speaker. So, um, and we, I was definitely drawing on some personal observations that I had made of how much, so some individuals that had really scored well on my experiment, and then when I was, they, they don't really speak with their friends, and they don't, I didn't hear them speaking around. So, uh, it was all part of the experiment, too, that in a lab setting, you kind of have your participants come in, and then you never see them again. In this case, it was sort of like, saw your participants once to work with them, and then you kind of keep seeing them around. So, it's a really small village. So, um, yeah, the greater implications of this experiment, it's kind of more of a comment on the language revitalization efforts. Um, it indicates that, you know, while language revitalization might not necessarily be promoting fluency in and of itself, it definitely is promoting lengua as an emblematic cultural facet. So, and it is upping the metalinguistic awareness, which is, um, it's a good thing. And then there's the final debate, which is, do palenqueros really code switch? Because they don't actually consider themselves to be code switching, and um, even when they do code switch, they are only ever inserting Spanish into lengua, and never lengua into Spanish. So this is um, sort of an interesting question that I'm thinking about following up on. I, too, am going for a discovery grant. So um, for now, over the break, I'm going to be analyzing the repetitions of the participants to see if they were self-correcting. Um, so for example, if they repeated the phrase and they repeated it just exactly as I had um, presented it to them, and then they give me a wrong answer about where the code switch is, then uh, that doesn't really indicate anything. But if they repeat it all in lengua, for example, and then they tell me that there was no code switch, there's something interesting about that. Um, if I were to evaluate this, this experiment in and of itself, I probably wouldn't have written my own stimuli. I probably would have just taken it from a corpus that already existed, because a lot of the stimuli I was told later were a little not natural. But um, 
Yeah, so any critiques, comments, or advice for our new experiment would be greatly appreciated. And uh, I would also like to just thank everybody who made this possible. Again, CLS, NSF, thank you so much. Thank you, Heather Mann. Thank you, Miriam. Thank you, Dr. Lipsky. And uh, a special thank you to my participants, my new Palenquero friends. Um, they really showed me what, it, what a close-knit community looks like, and it was... It was really nice to be welcomed into such a such a warm environment. <laughs> um, yeah, that's it. Thank you for listening. So we have time for maybe one question. Carrie, or two questions. Yes. Carrie. Um, you mentioned that one of the factors that seemed to distinguish your top five was cultural entrepreneurship. I'm just curious if you could explain what that means. Um, so, <laughs> I think it is a, a wide definition, but they, they put a lot of that on the, the sociolinguistic survey. And I think cultural entrepreneurship is kind of just, um, it's the, they speak lingua, it's the combi les ami type, they have this movement that, um, Doctors, you can help me out with this at any moment. But the sorry. Oh, what's happening? Okay. So they um, there's a lot of, for example, there are a lot of musicians. I'm gonna take this There are a lot of musicians. There's a music group that really they're called Combiles Ami, and they sing in lengua, and they try and um, they're they're advertising the music itself, but they're also advertising the culture of lengua of, of I'm sorry the Palenquero culture and this type of cultural entrepreneurship is really important for them. But they all say cultural entrepreneur, and it could mean a variety of things. So, this is doing. You had a question. Yeah. So, how did you decide to break up your your age groups? Do you think if you had divided them differently, you would have found an age difference? Yeah, that was another step in the in the reevaluating the experiment. Um, Twenty five is kind of just a, an arbitrary number. I was divi dividing it in sort of the like when language revitalization started, and it started about 20 years ago. So 25 was um, a judgment that I had made before going. With hindsight, I probably would have made it a little bit older or younger. I would have changed it from 25, yeah. So. Yeah, Mike? Just one comment. <clears throat> um, so the idea of metalinguistic knowledge uh, playing a role, it kind of is in tune with some of this idea this idea that, that salience, right, that, that the ability of the individual to recognize when something comes from the other language is what really defines a code switch. And so if we take our linguist hats off and we, and we don't kind of like analyze it from this objective, you know, analytical perspective, um, but instead turn it on to the individual and determine what do they think um, is the actual code switch. I think one thing that might play a role in that is something like attention. And so you mentioned something like working memory coming online, but I wonder if also something just like general attentional capacity might also play a role. And if you might throw in just a simple little attention task and see how that might correlate with what you're finding. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a good comment. I mean, again, I, the, the research experience came into such a play too that I got to sort of hang out with each participant. So I do have... There are a lot of observations that I made about their attentiveness throughout the task, too. So looking at their individual performances, I could say, like, oh, she did really poorly, but I know she speaks lingo really well, and she was just really tired that day. So, yeah, it's a, it's a good point. Anything else? I do have a follow-up to that question. So one way in which, because I had a similar comment, so I wonder whether one way in which you can go back and address that question with the data you currently have even though you have not collected individual measures of cognitive ability or capacity, is to look, I, I noticed that some of your sentences were short mm -hmm. and other ones were long, mm -hmm. and all of them had code switches. So I wonder whether you separate your materials into some way in which you can divide short and longer sentences and now look at what, how participants um, perform in, in, in these two types of, you know, with the two types of materials, because then you might see differences surfacing between the uh, the younger and the, you, you call them the younger and the adult group, um, in terms of way, where it is that they might identify the code switch. So it might be that 
the speakers who are the more established speakers perform better on the longer sentences, whereas everybody actually is doing really well in the shorter sentences. So I wonder whether you separate those two. I don't know how much, how many long and short sentences you have, but it's another way of getting at the question of attention, uh, because the assumption is that shorter sentences are going to be better attended to by the by the individuals than the longer sentences that may you know, make them wander. Mm -hmm. Well, we did break it down, and we were, there were many charts, of course, you didn't see. And actually, I think it really probably turns out that the shorter ones were the ones they thought were all in one language or another. So there's probably some cumulative effect, you know, these ones where it switched midway, and then they just kept hearing more and more of the second language. I think there was probably, at some point, it crossed the threshold where they go, oh, hell, it's changed, you know? Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> okay. I had to put it in those terms. I think that's probably more likely, because some of the short sentences, you know, we, we did break it down. And, um, but we're not doing any better. Okay. Yeah. I have. Yeah. Janet. Well, just to follow up on that, I can imagine that if another, if you have the lexical switch is only one word, so you may have easily mm -hmm. missed it, right? As yeah. being a code switch. Whereas if you have a full alternation switch to the other language, you know, you have all these additional confirmations that there's really right. a code switch right. going right. on. So well, this is why she asked me to repeat it first to make right. sure at least they heard it. Not yeah. Totally yeah. That is what we found. I mean, the alternation was more consistently right, identified exactly. with the ones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think yeah. it may just be the volume of uh, the switch per se that helps them to recognize the switch. So it could be um, quantity of cues versus yeah. quality of yeah. cues that tips them off. Yeah. 